All right, we are live. I see my little ticker on the top counting. <laughs> I'm back. I'm like, we are back to back interviews, you guys, because we're like, I have so much to talk about with everybody. And we're so excited. I have Nicole with me. Nicole, I am so excited to have you join us. Um, let I'm going to let you introduce yourself and tell everyone about you and what you offer and who you are and all of the things. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And hello, everybody on this beautiful, sunshiny day. It's just saying that uh, the warm weather just makes me so happy. Um, so I am a registered psychotherapist, but I'm also a, I like to call myself a perfectly imperfect um, wife and mama. So my kids are much older now. I have a tween daughter and a teen son. Um, but starting my own business has kind of felt a little bit like I have a new baby at home that I'm caring for. So it's been bringing up a lot of a lot of those memories of those early days. Um, so I worked for a nonprofit agency in Cambridge for almost 20 years and um, worked with a variety of people and issues, but just really found that um, my passion was with supporting mums and helping to ease that transition to parenthood and bring some specialized training that I have. Um, the program called Bringing Baby Home, which is based on the Gottman's research, mm -hmm. and to be able to support moms, even if their partners aren't involved, there's things that that um, that I'm able to support them with in terms of communication and identifying and honoring their needs that um, often can have a positive impact, just, not just for them, but for the relationship as well. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I also love to do is write. And so I do contribute to the Gottman Institute blog regularly. And years ago, I had a regular column in the Holistic Parent magazine, which is a local magazine in the Waterloo region, and mine with the Mindful Mama col column. And so I was sort of sharing, reflecting on some of these practices that I was learning and how it was really helping me as a parent and wanting to then share that wisdom with others. For sure, I love it. Um, and tell us a little bit about the Climb Out of the, the Darkness um, initiative that's in Waterloo Region. And just for those that might not be familiar with that, I've, I know I've heard of them and I've talked to them a little bit, but let's dive a little bit deeper into that project. Sure. I. I personally don't know a whole lot. I was just really passionate about the mission, which is mm -hmm. the idea of bringing more awareness and funding for people who are struggling with perinatal um, and postpartum mood disorders and might not be able to access the support on their own, um, either through you know not having access to group insurance or other barriers that you know that they may face. So the Climb is really a walk, um, but the idea of the climb is sort of like these are different ways that you know we're sort of providing a helping hand to help the climb out of that because when you're in that space, it can feel very um, daunting and, and overwhelming and lonely. And mm -hmm. so I think um, you know raising that awareness, and we're coming up to maternal global maternal mental health day next month, and so raising that awareness is so important. Um, and then, of course, making sure that, you know, if people are starting to identify with the symptoms, then, then they know where to go for help and, and that cost doesn't become a barrier for them. So we'll be yeah. walking in June, um, June 25th, I believe it is. And um, and then I guess the 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 funding as the walk is part of a larger initiative uh, mm -hmm. through Postpartum Support um, International. And this is their 10th year of doing uh the climb out of the darkness and this is my first year um, of participating so I'm excited to to be a part of that and, and continue to raise awareness and hopefully some funds to support yeah, my that's community. Amazing. I love that. yeah, yeah wonderful yeah it's definitely um, something that's popped up into into my um, field of vision in the last um, couple months and and seeing it's much more um, prevalent there and the, here and there but also just post pandemic because you know hopefully we we can say post pandemic <laughs> pandemic that we're you know coming out of that darkness yeah. as well 
Um, yeah. So it kind of leads into that as well too, because we all know how mental health issues are on the rise. And um, I know that, you know, even through my own community, how people have been struggling um, dealing with postpartum and just not knowing where to find support or not, again, being able to afford support. So I think that's it's such a great project to have and, and such a great initiative. And, and I love fundraiser walks, you know, the fitness part of me, that makes me very happy, right? <laughs> Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And and that sense of coming together as community, um, I think because we have been so disconnected and a part of the reason for the increase in symptoms and symptom severity is the isolation and being cut off from our village, right? You know, as they say, it takes a village to raise a child. And I believe it takes a village to nurture and support each mama too and mm -hmm. so when we don't have that it's it's so much harder so even just uh, the idea of being able to get out of our house and, and come together and there's going to be some some fun things as well for different ages and um, stages uh, of family members and, and stuff so yeah Wonderful. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about you and your background, your story, your why. Like, let's let's dive in a little bit deeper to how you came to this place and uh, how you got here. Yeah. So when I think about some of the different things in my own personal life, I can definitely see how those are the issues and the causes that I've um Kind of been pulled towards obviously wanting to learn more about to support myself and then in turn um, seeing the difference that it's made for me has then you know propelled me to want to share that either through my writing or through individual and, and group uh, counseling sessions and so one of the things for me has been in a lifelong sort of struggle with anxiety and i'm a highly sensitive person and didn't really have a name for anxiety at the time when I was younger, but I got a lot of stomach aches. I got sick a lot. And um, just generally, it was that generalized kind of anxiety. And so I used to call myself neurotic <laughs> um, and tended to, you know, have that that worried or that negative view of, of things. And um, so I've worked a lot on that and um, had the opportunity to be able to create and facilitate a group specifically around anxiety. And when the pandemic came and there was so much uncertainty, I felt really compelled just to start sharing. And, and it was through social media where I would share sort of about some of these mindset shifts and some of the practices that had really helped me to be able to move from being in a state of worry to, you know, opening up to trusting and to holding on to hope and, you know, and even um, embracing uncertainty with more courage and, um, and, and how do we support our children in, you know, fostering the resilience in, in our children. So that mm -hmm. piece of my journey and, and um, I was sharing recently, you know, sometimes it, it still hits me. Um, but it's uh, it's something, you know, that I believe that healing is kind of ongoing, lifelong work, but we can definitely learn practices and change some of the ways, the things that we've internalized that is going to help to reduce the intensity and the severity and the frequency. Um, so that's a piece of my story that really influences the, the work that I do. And, uh, and as a mama with things, you know, when you have anxiety, it, it's all about that sort of, you know, trying to control, right, and putting on having all this pressure that we put on ourselves, but then we have the, you know, the sort of resistance from our natural resistance from our children, because they don't want to be controlled, right. Mm -hmm. And um, so that learning that process of being able to let go and to, to trust, um, and to, you know, to be in the discomfort of of all of that and so my own parenting journey was not an easy one <laughs> I struggled a lot and um, but then as I saw different practices supporting me as I saw doing sort of that inner healing inner child work growing up again kind of alongside of them and seeing the benefits um, not just for my children but also in my marriage and then of course in how I showed up as a therapist um, 
that really inspired me to want to focus and, and support mom. And growing up, I was one of, um, well, no other children until I think about grade four or five uh, of a child of divorce. And so that's very different than, you know, our reality today. But um, I think that experience and then doing work with people who had both used abuse as well as who had experienced abuse either in their present relationship or as a child um, really pushed me to want to learn everything that I could about healthy relationships and how do we how do we foster those relationships? How do we protect, you know, relationships? And um, personally, got me involved in sort of social justice and women's rights, and you know that that whole piece of um, violence against women, and and how do we, you know, the bigger issues as far as patriarchy and colonialism, and you know, all of all of that stuff. Um, led me on a, a journey as well. And so that social justice is a piece of the, the work that I bring um, in my conversations with clients, as well as involvement in the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful, yeah. Such a, you know, big, um, like realm, you know, like just this, this big, huge bubble of things, right? Um, and touching back on the anxiety, I think um, it's it's such a hard diagnosis for a lot of people because you know we, we all have stress we all have anxious thoughts we all have anxious feelings but sometimes it's just hits that point where it's engulfs your life and becomes very overwhelming and um being someone who has suffered that as well too i lost my mom um mm -hmm. when i was in my 20s and yeah. ended up getting pregnant with my now 18 year old um very shortly after so i mm -hmm wasn't able to grieve properly and wasn't able mm -hmm. to kind of go through that stage and, and develop like, and deal with those feelings until mm -hmm. after I started going back to work and I left my daughter mm -hmm. and that's when it hit me, you know? Right. So we all kind of go through our, sometimes our own journeys and, um, and, and anxiety and having those things. And, and I always thought I was going to have to be on medication forever, you know, to deal with my anxiety and just everything. But I have learned through um, movement, through, you know, mental wellness and through talking to people and having mm. conversations with someone yeah. like yourself and finding those tools to my toolbox that when I'm getting anxious thoughts or I'm, I'm getting anxious feelings, how I can deal with those and find, you know, different ways and different outlets. So I'm a runner. Running is my mm. mental health break. <laughs> <laughs> my way to be able to go out pound the pavement and just leave everything behind and just almost like detox my brain oh. so that is like my biggest coping school not everybody can be a runner and that's totally okay yeah. but that, that's <laughs> my thing and I know quite a few of my clients that you know that's their happy place as well too is just being oh. able to be out of their own heads and just listening to their heart, listening to their feet hit the pavement and just being in that moment at that time. But having someone like yourself that they can turn to and have those conversations when they're having, you know, a hard time or having um, things popping in their lives. Everybody has changed, but especially COVID and the isolation. And, you know, I think those are just really important conversations to have. The hard conversations, but they are yeah. really important conversations to have for sure well and Rebecca I think you you brought up such an important point and that is that often unprocessed grief shows up as anxiety mm -hmm. right and so one of the things when I made the decision to leave the agency and start my own private practice last September was um, for my physical health as well I just I needed to move more um, to yeah. move that stress out of my body. So, um, and so I walk offer walking sessions, but I was also thinking about how, you know, on the one hand, anxiety is a normal response to what we've been going through because there has been all these increased um, threats of danger and um, the uncertainty and the lack of control, right? So that's a breeding ground that's going yeah. to trigger our anxiety. But also, I don't think we've ever had well, we've never lived through a period like this of such unprecedented loss. And, you know, there's, there's the loss of loved ones. Um, but then there is also so many 
other sort of secondary losses that have an impact. And yet, because we live in a society that is, you know, that toxic positivity, you know, push through, or we end up comparing ourselves to someone else and thinking, well, why should I be upset about this? Look at all the good things happening in my life. And I think what's really important is that we give ourselves permission to honor, feel whatever we're feeling and know if that we can move through that grief, it's not going to manifest in other ways. Mm -hmm. So anxiety is one way it can manifest. Other ways is, you know, we, as we stuff it down, it's like stuffed emotion, little energy, and we get very tired and, you know, sort of lose that motivation or move into more of that depressive kind of um, experience. And, uh, you know, and then we can be hard on ourselves for the things that we're not doing that we think we should be doing. Yeah. Um, and it, it can have kind of a bit of a vicious cycle. So uh, I think one of the things that is really important and yet still tricky is, you know, we don't, have to wait until we're really struggling to reach out for that support. And Mm -hmm. if anything, it's so much easier to be able to implement what, you know, what we're learning and to make those changes, you know, to stick and be consistent uh, when, you know, earlier on, as opposed to just keep kind of pushing through and pushing through Mm -hmm. till we get to that point where we're completely burnt out or, you know, we are really in a severe, a severe state. With yeah. our mental I, think, I think as mothers, we tend to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Just and just keep on <laughs> moving and keep yeah. on pushing through. And, yeah. you know, like, we think that, you know, and our own self care, and I know self care is a word that is thrown around very, you know, freely nowadays, but, you know, yeah. there is, you know, more to self care than spa days. And, you know, it's, it's providing Mm -hmm. yourself with those essential needs. And, you know, maybe talking to someone and finding your community and finding your village, that's part of your self care and having just that way to have an outlet and, and speaking, you know, freely about what's happening in your life, that can be self care to you, you know, you know, even just having for me, my, my self care is just having a coffee in silence in the mornings, Mm -hmm. you know, just like, (laughs) <sighs> breathing yes. quietly, having those few minutes to myself where I can yeah. reflect about myself the day, you know, giving myself that, you know, almost like prime time to lead into what my day is going to be, which is usually chaotic, which I thrive <laughs> on. But, <laughs> but you, sometimes you just, you need to find those, those little moments and those little things. Tell me yeah, about. Absolutely. Yeah. We, have to be, we have to kind of be grounded and sort of do the opposite of what society says, which is put everyone else first. We need to start with ourselves. And like you said, honor those basic needs, make sure that we're, you know, in a good space in terms of our nervous system and the energy that we're bringing. And, you know, even as simple as making sure we're nourishing ourselves with food, because a lot of mamas, you know, they'll feed the kids first, and then, you know, they'll eat the scraps, <laughs> you know, off the plate, if that. Um, and my body won't let me, I get hangry. So, <laughs> I have to, you know, I, I have to, but I'm a much happier mama if I feed myself first, you know. Um, yeah, so it's sort of learning through those experiences to challenge some of those messages that you know that we've gotten and so my mission is to help to liberate moms from that pressure that they have to be perfect because it's an impossible standard to live up to Mm -hmm. and this this belief that we have to do it all yeah yeah for sure again back to that village I think I think this is going to be the running theme of the day will be it takes a village Mm -hmm. um and, yeah. you know, we have our village coming together and sharing with everyone today. But um, I think with, that we almost just need to reiterate that and, you know, and and go back to that often as well. Yeah, for sure. So mm-hmm. tell me about specifically like the clients that, that you serve and then the services that you offer. Let's kind of touch on those a little bit. We've kind of like skimmed the surface, but let's dive a little yeah. bit deeper. For sure, for sure. So I'm offering virtual sessions. I'm primarily focusing um, on women, um, most of whom are mothers. Um, Being a highly sensitive person, being someone who has kind of worked sort of on the front lines of trauma and that, um, and having recovered from vicarious trauma and burnout, I'm passionate about supporting those, you know, those folks. Um, I 
seem to be getting more teachers who, you know, a lot of our, our teachers are burning out because of, you know, not only all of what's been put on their plate, but also the amount of dysregulation in the students that, you know, they're trying to support and how that impacts the classroom. Um, so, and then as I mentioned, walking sessions. So when the weather cooperates um, and so that, you know, we can still have that sort of therapeutic conversation, but then there's also those elements of, you know, like you were saying, just connecting to your body, you know, and really like, that's what self-care is all about, right? Like, what am I noticing? What am I needing? And a lot of us do get disconnected from our bodies. And, and that's part of what is adding to the stress or the lack of awareness of, you know, sort of our own inner knowing and trusting in that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I love bringing that element of, of nature and, and movement and, and body connection back into it. Um, and then I also do workshops and presentations. So I do workshops for organizations, uh, which tend to be uh, focused on, again, recovering from this pandemic, acknowledging the impacts, trauma-informed. Uh, I did one related to raising resilient children and and different aspects of um, of the parenting, you know, the parenting journey, the struggles, and some of the things that we want to work on. Um, I also am launching a virtual program, a group program called Breaking Free from Perfectionism, uh, because I know not all mamas um, are able to or want to commit to individual sessions, but they, uh, you know, if I can help them to let go of some of that pressure, and 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 it's a deep dive so it's not therapy but I am pulling out all of these different aspects because it's not just as simple as saying oh you don't have to be perfect just let go of being perfect or even this idea of you know it takes a village just ask for help like each of these things that we know we should do we need to do there's often barriers there's often internalized beliefs mm -hmm. that may be getting in the way and what can then happen is then we because it's kind of pr projected as simple and easy, we can then internalize a sense of self blame or shame if we're not able to follow through with those things. And so what, what I really try to help clients to do in the individual sessions um, and with this program is really start to unpack, you know, like what are some of those barriers? And then here are some of the things that have supported me and clients that I've supported in making that move from, you know, from perfectionism to more of that self-acceptance that we are perfectly imperfect, um, but that our authenticity, our vulnerability is like, that's our, our superpower, that they're, you know, beautiful gifts that we can, you know, that we can bring yeah. um, to, to everything, yeah. our relationships and our, and our work. So, yeah. And then I write uh, a blog, which I also am recording it because I try to have a bit of a mini meditation. Um, I really want to invite people to do that self reflection, as mm -hmm. opposed to tell them what to do, because I believe that each of us is the expert on ourselves. So, um, so a lot of the free guides that I have, and the um, meditations is, is about, you know, inviting you to connect and to, you know, um, identify sort of what feels right for you. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you need right now? And so it's kind of shutting out some of that outside noise and coming back to our own inner truth. Yeah, for sure. And I love that perfectly imperfect. I think mm -hmm. in this day of age, and we've talked about this in a couple of the conversations today, is that we live in that Instagrammable society and everybody wants to be Instagram perfect and live Instagram mm -hmm. lives. But in real life, it's messy. You know, yes. life is messy. Kids are messy. Like, you know, everything yes. is messy. Postpartum is messy. You know, yes. this is real life. Real life is messy. And it is okay to not yes. have it all together all the time. You know, you can have those perfect moments where it might be, you know, a little get together or the perfect little outfit that you put on your child at that <laughs> one time. But two seconds later, they're going to puke up on it and you're yes. going to have to take it off. So, you know, we can yes. have those perfect moments and achieve perfection every once in a while but really life is imperfect and it's the same goes back for me for fitness as well too I always say you know taking imperfect action is better than yeah. no action at all right you know just yeah. having you know even if you do a squat if it's not like a perfectly 
perfect squat, that's okay. You move right. your body as long as you're not hurting yourself or anyone else, then it's fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. you've, got, you've, you've achieved something, you've done something, you've moved on to something, you've moved into something, you know, those little yeah. imperfect actions and living imperfectly, it's amazing. You know what? We're all yeah. not and we all do not have Instagrammable lives and it is okay. <laughs> yeah. And not only is it is it okay, but like that's where the rich connections are formed. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I when I was struggling when my kids were younger and you know, I was trying to be perfect and then every little mistake, every struggle just was like a you know, internalized as not just mother guilt, but shame, you know, like I, 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 what am I doing wrong? There's something wrong with me. I'm a bad mother, you know, all of those, those messages. And often that, that I hear from clients and when I finally started opening up and, and sharing with a few trusted friends, it was like amazing. The, I, cause I felt so alone in that when I was going through all that by myself. And then the, the contrast was as we share, like, oh, I'm not the only one. And okay, yeah, yeah, as I saying it out loud to somebody else, it doesn't sound as bad as it did in my own head with my inner critic and, you know, all of that. So I think it's also, you know, it, there, there is, um, there's so many gifts on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, it's exhausting pretending, it's exhausting trying to live up to these um impossible standards and it's very lonely yeah for sure yeah 100 percent. and uh i think the more we talk about things and the more we have these kind of things where things are raw and real and you know we're we're putting ourselves out there as human beings being vulnerable and sharing our stories and you know sharing um you know what makes us made our journey and what brought us to these places. I think that is, that is super important. And, uh, it just, yeah. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love what you do. Uh, well, I, we've had a social relationship up until this point. We haven't actually yeah. had too many conversations, but yeah, I'm, I'm in KW area. So we'll definitely have to make connections, uh, in the future and, uh, maybe do some walking together for sure. Yeah, that would be great. I would love that. What is one thing you wish your new, your clients knew more of and why? Okay. So there, there's kind of two pieces there. Um, <laughs> um, so the one is understanding our, our nervous systems mm -hmm. and how much our nervous system um, impacts us on an unconscious level. Um, so depending on what state we're in, that's going to affect what we think about ourselves, what we think about the world, and in turn, then how we react. And I think once we understand this, two things can happen. One is we can shine out some of that self-blame and shame. Um, and then two, we, we can start to work with our nervous systems. We can start to figure out what our unique nervous system needs in order to, to be at its best. And that's a journey that I went on personally um, that made such a huge difference for me and my family and so of course is something that you know I share with them um, with my clients and try to weave into that that writing piece and then the, the other piece would be conscious parenting and so that understanding that you know our role or our job as parents our primary job is really to um, not control our children but to allow them to you know um, grow into their you know beautiful authentic selves and then we grow up again alongside them mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. when we're triggered by them rather than trying to change that behavior see it in a negative light we need to step back and get curious and say huh what's this about for me when have mm -hmm. i felt this way before what is this um telling me that maybe there's something that i need to heal or something i need to reclaim you know, one thing with my son who um, his energy level was really overwhelming. And part of that was because I am highly sensitive. So just all the sensory stuff was overwhelming me. But also there was these old messages that I had gotten when I was little, you know, stop fidgeting, calm down, don't be so hyper, right? And, um, and so you know, when he'd engaged in some of that behavior, it triggered this, 
this reaction of this is bad, I need to stop this or contain this. And when I was able to understand, no, this is really, he's actually really here to help me reclaim this part of myself. You know, mm -hmm. like I love to move and I love to be goofy and silly and laugh at my own laughter. And, and that's, that's the invitation. That's the opportunity that we can go on with our children. And it's not about blaming ourselves. I think it's really about empowering ourselves because rather than, you know, we can't ultimately control anyone else. And, you know, there's going to be all kinds of problems that come along with that. Mm -hmm. um, so when we focus on doing our own work, you know, it's a beautiful gift that we're giving, that they're giving to us in a sense, and that we then in turn are able to give them because then we can show up more in that integrated, authentic self, right? As we reclaim those pieces, um, we're not going to be sort of projecting our old wounds or worries or fears onto them because we've worked to heal some of that stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And parenthood is, is it's growth. For everybody, you yes. know, for us as parents, for our children, it's yeah. ever evolving, ever changing. I have three girls mm. <laughs> and I like, you know, how you find little pieces in each one of your children that it's like, oh, oh that's that or this, you know, all three of my girls are stubborn. They have their minds of their own. They're just like their mother, like they <laughs> are very much, you know, and we constantly, but mm. all the time I do have to take a step back and be like, okay why why am i reacting in that right. you yeah. know and and having those conversations with myself and trying to like ch just change you know and and trying oh. to grow myself as i grow as a mother as i grow as a parent and the same thing i it's funny you said that because my son we were going through our words last night and he was dancing around every time he said <laughs> a word and I was getting a little aggravated i'm like why is he dancing but i and then i was just like no that's his way of like you know, doing his thing and being creative. He is just like a oh. very flamboyant little boy. And he's a very sensitive as well too. And that's just his way of like, kind of like car and having fun and doing a little twirl. And I was just like, no, that's, you know, why am I getting aggravated with that? That's just him. That's his yeah. personality that's his way of expressing himself. And yeah. I love that, 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 that your story like totally resonated with me. And, and I was just like, yeah. And I became aware of that feeling that I was feeling yeah. towards him and was able to like, yeah. you know, change my thought process and change that. And I think yeah. it, it's hard for some parents to cut those cords from those things that we are taught from our parents that they yeah. are taught from their parents. And, you know, trying to change that, that generational, you know, traumas or generational teachings that maybe just don't apply anymore. You know, like yeah. maybe 50, 60 years ago, that was the way things are done. But things are different now and we live in a different day and we live in a different age. We live in a different society. Um, sometimes some things are good. Sometimes some things are not so great. You know, the yeah. <laughs> access to technology, for example, but you know, it, it's nice to have someone like yourself that can help with those things. And, you know, I'm feeling like we need to have lots more conversations, <laughs> Maybe just <laughs> but, but just to, to kind of find those things and, 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 and find our own path and find our own way with some guidance. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I often find that, you know, our, our body is sending us these messages, right. But then, depending on how regulated we are, you know, we're either going to react or we're going to be able to do that awareness piece, right? And that sort of discernment piece, right? How much of this is something that's a problem in the present versus how much of this is, you know, triggering something in the past. And then when it is a case of we're, we want to change, right? We want to break that cycle. We want to do things differently. Then sometimes we also need help to be able to then that and hold those boundaries with the, the people around us. And that can be really hard, right? Depending on the relationship and depending on, you know, how dependent we might be on, you know, on those people. So that's often a piece too, where therapy can be really helpful because one of the big things that needs to happen is with that growing up again piece is learning that, hey, you know what? I can give to myself what I didn't get you know, and because sometimes we'll keep in a relationship um, and keep searching for or seeking something that is a normal and natural need, mm -hmm. right? But for whatever reason, our, our caregivers or partner can't give that to us. Mm -hmm. And 
we can internalize that as again, you know, that's shame, something's wrong with me. Or we can come to sort of that place of radical acceptance and say like, this need is important. And how can I start to give it to myself? And then something beautiful often happens is then as we are validating that need and starting to give it to ourselves, then we start to find other people out there that uh, are able to kind of fill sometimes some of those voids and sort of be like surrogate, um, you know, parents or mentors or or what have you, you know, and the conscious parenting is also I find like that concept works really well in our partner relationship, you know, as well. And there's been times when I've been so triggered by my husband, but I've learned to kind of, okay, step back, do some reflective writing. And sometimes I don't even need to talk to him about it because I realize, you know what, this, this isn't even really about him. <laughs> you know? This is me. And so it's like, oh, thank you. Cause this was this piece, you know, of healing that I, you know, that I needed to, to do. Um, and so we can apply it, we can apply it in, you know, our relationships with um, a, if we have a boss or if we have uh, co-workers or like anybody really that's triggering us, it can, it's just so much more empowering, you know, than being stuck mm-hmm. and frustrated or angry or, um, you know, feeling bad about what's happening, but powerless to change it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And don't they always say like someone who like might tweak you the wrong way it's nothing wrong with them. It's Mm -hmm. something that is you that they're triggering or they're, you know, bringing up or bringing forward that it's, it's never usually that person. It's, it's something inside you that they're, they're creating that tension inside yourself. And then you're, you know, you're almost reflecting it on them and pushing them away because you think it's them, but it's really something internal that that they're triggering with you. Right. So, yeah. yeah, And of course, with the exception of, you know, an abusive relationship. Yes, yes, exactly right? that. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and so when people have grown up in abusive relationships, sometimes they can be more prone, mm-hmm. more vulnerable to then being, you know, an abusive relationship in their partner relationship because that's what's familiar. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and so we do have to sort of tease that out too, you know, and, and look at safety. Um, because yes, there's that piece of, you know, what, what am I ultimately responsible for? Or what do I have power over? But the rules change when, you know, when we identify that there's abuse happening and yeah, the priority yeah. becomes safety. Yeah. And I think um, that is becoming more prevalent as well to yeah. ex- especially with the COVID, but then they've introduced that hand signal. So they introduced that kind of as trying to become a normal part of society that if you are um, in a situation and you can't specifically speak about that situation, but using that hand signal um, Mm -hmm. and sharing that there is something going on and alerting someone else. um, I think that is, is amazing. Um, And I think that's something, and we'll definitely, I'll be sharing that um, in the group as well too, for those that aren't familiar Mm -hmm. with that. But I think, you know, having things like that and having tools like that where we can almost silently reach out to someone, um, I think is really important. Um, and especially, you know, more and more, you know, with the mental health issues, not just with us, but with partners and things that are happening, you know, post them and pandemic and, you know, statistics are there showing how much of an increase that there are mental health issues and things that are happening. So I think that we really need to, to have more of these conversations and, um, you know, talking more about these things and, and protecting, you know, ourselves and our families and, and our partners as well, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm so glad that you, you brought that up, because there often is a lot of, of shame and a lot of barriers. Um, and sometimes people don't even realize that the relationship is is abusive, especially when it's verbal abuse, emotional abuse, as opposed to, you know, there's actual physical markers, you know, that, that something is, is happening. Um, and years ago, uh, as part of a committee that I was on, we brought awareness to the community about a program, an initiative called Neighbors, Friends and Families. And it's a website that provides information as sort of the the people that have information, you know, somebody tells a part of a story here, somebody tells a part of a story here. But if people don't know that that's a warning sign, 
that, you know, that is a risk factor. Mm -hmm. Um, then, you know, then the, the person in that situation is, is, is more at risk. And so that initiative was about educating the community and giving them awareness. So there's, um, sort of three components to that one is just understanding risk factors safety planning and then um, how to talk to men who are using abuse and a lot of people don't realize that um, you can reach out to the shelter Mm -hmm. and connect with an outreach worker without planning to leave like you don't have to be intending to stay in the shelter to be able to get that support of an outreach worker. And you also don't have to be experiencing physical abuse. It can, you know, that emotional abuse is enough for, you know, for them to offer that support. So that's something I think is important. And and I love what, um, I think it's the Women's Foundation, the Canadian Women's Foundation that put out the help signal. There's mm-hmm. also additional resources and, and information to, um, to help the community members understand and recognize those, those signs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and yeah, that's an important thing, I think, to say that it's not just physical. There's so many other forms of abuse. And it, I mean, it's always been there, but it's it's being, you know, brought up into the limelight and being more talked about. And, you know, again, not really normalized, but it's just a little bit more of a, a common conversation that is starting to come up. And, you know, as people that we're professionals that are working with other people we try to you know watch for signs you know even like with my clients i you know if i see something or something might feel off you know i might just you know have a conversation with someone and just be like Mm -hmm. are you okay you know like can i can i meet you for coffee can we have a talker you know or you know even if they're just having an off day and they're super teary or something i might you know pull them off to the side and be like how can i support you what can i give you you know and i think we we have to have that community and we have to have that village again um and and watching our mamas you know specifically because they're kind of our vulnerable ones for for a while until they find their their little way through life and they find you know their their ground and they get their foot you know they get their feet wet and they get their footings in but you know that first six weeks you know to a year can be such a daunting (laughs) trying hard you know it's joyful and amazing to have this new little human being that you are now Mm -hmm. in charge of it it's it's hard you know and absolutely yeah you know, and yeah. and it can that. really have an impact on on the couple relationship. Yes. And, um, you know, for for some folks, if they, you know, have, you know, sort of these more rigid beliefs, um, if they don't have that, you know, that sort of nervous system regulation, you know, they tend to be more dysregulated, um, you know, the, the lack of sleep and the, you know, all of all of the stressors that are associated, you know, with that can really have an impact on a relationship and, you know, and can, you know, at some point sort of be a, a starting point for abusive behavior. And it's it's so important for men to be able to make that shift from sort of me to we, you know, and, and to recognize um, that move out of those old sort of stereotypical old school ways of, you know, thinking and really embrace this and in an equal partnership and even starting with, I mean, the pandemic's made it harder, but wherever possible, even starting with the pregnancy, you know, attending those visits, being as engaged and involved as possible early on really is going to help um, support and prevent, potentially prevent postpartum for, you know, for mamas. Because again, there's, you know, it's not all falling on them. They're not dealing with the added stressors or, or fears or criticism um, from their partners. And so it just can make that transition so much easier. I think co-parenting, you know, is, is such a prevalent thing. And um, mm-hmm. I always laugh when, you know, guys are like, oh, are you babysitting your kids today? And it's just like, <laughs> no, I'm parenting, you know, and yeah. my, you know, that's one thing my spouse has always said from the beginning, like, I don't babysit my own children. I parent them because we are, we're co-parents. We're together in this relationship. We're together as parents. It's just not, 
you know, me doing all the mothering, you know, he does the half the mothering too, <laughs> you know, like, you know, the, the house, the everything, the chores, everything, we share everything. And that's, you know, like, realistically, it doesn't always happen that way. But, you know, yeah. it's just having nice to have a spouse who thinks that same way as well, too. And, and I, I do feel like a lot of um, partners are coming into that, you know, now and, you know, that that way of thinking that, you know, it's not just like dad comes home from work and dinner's <laughs> on the table. And, you know, again, that's not real. That's not yeah. real. Like that is not how life works. And, you know, again, we go back yeah. to the messy. <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, sometimes we as moms have to look at, you know, where we're not, again, not intentionally, not consciously, but where we might be kind of um, not creating space because of, you know, that pressure to be perfect and to do it all. And, you know, or we're holding it in, you know, because we're not comfortable or we don't really, uh, we don't really have the the skills to assertively communicate and ask for what we want. And it either, you know, we stuff it in or it comes out in, you know, in a, a tack kind of thing and then person just pulls away so being able to you know kind of support and coach mums to first of all validate you know like your your needs are legitimate and no it's not possible to do it all by yourself and then okay let's start to look at how you know how you're you're expressing you know your frustrations or your complaints and and how can we start to change that dynamic so you can bring more of a um what the Gottmans refer to as a uh the fondness and admiration system and a culture of appreciation and we bring more of that in and then invite that responsibility and it becomes a very different dynamic and you know not all the time because there are some cases where the person is very much stuck in their ways, but there has, you know, there's often been then that shift that starts mm -hmm. to happen. You know, the person, the partner becomes more reciprocal and sees, oh, okay, this is, um, this is needed. This is important. And, and then starts to feel good about it. And, you know, you can get more of that. So it, you're not, you know, I think it's really important for moms to, to know that you're not stuck um, it doesn't have to always be like this. It doesn't have to always be this hard. Uh, and again, it's not to say that you're doing anything specifically wrong. It's just that these are skills, right, that we haven't all learned or, or you know, witnessed. You know, a lot of us didn't grow up having healthy communication and problem solving modeled for us. Yeah. For right. Sure. So it's a new, you know, it's a new set of skills that, you know, that we have to learn at a time when we're exhausted and, you know, have all these hormones flooding our system and all the rest of it. So it can feel very, you know, very overwhelming. Um, yeah. And in that overwhelm and shame and loneliness, we can sometimes forget that we are not alone and that there is support available. Um, yeah, for sure. Again, yeah. why we go back to why we do this, right? You know, yeah. the biggest reason for hosting, you know, an event yeah. like this is, is, is to have these conversations, to have these raw talks, to talk yeah. things out and just share, you know, like just yeah. share maybe that like, hey, you guys aren't alone. You know, we're here for yeah. you and, and we've been there or, you know, we've had clients go through something very similar and, you know, that mm -hmm. you know, you're never, ever alone. What would you, what kind of um, books, podcasts, experts, what have in, has inspired you or what would you recommend? Mm. Well, if we come back to that idea of, you know, being vulnerable and, and sharing, you know, sharing the hard parts, um, but then also she is just like such a, a gifted storyteller and, and her words are so beautiful. So that would be Rachel Macy Stafford. Um, she is known sort of uh, as the hands-free revolution if you look for her on um, Instagram or uh, Facebook um, but she's written a few different books and, and again about moving away from that pressure to be perfect and uh, she also talked a lot about the hands-free comes from that idea of letting go of being sort of tethered to our technology and being being more present um, that you know, and that pressure to always be on and to always respond, how that really impacted her ability to parent. And, and um, so she has shared 
kind of the journey. And her last book that came out um, in 2020 was about raising teens, Live Love Now. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's beautiful. So she has another one coming out, I think, next year. Um, and so I was a part of the book launch team for Live Love Now. And it was such beautiful timing because we were starting this pandemic and lockdown <laughs> with, you know, with our kids and mine being a tween and a teen and very much pulled to the screen. Um, it was, there's just so much wisdom and guidance. And even if you don't have teens yet, I, I saw a lot of value um, mm-hmm. in that. But even just her her writing that she shares, she's, they said she's a storyteller and, and weaves that in. Um, Dr. Shafali Tesberry is, um, sort of created the conscious parenting movement kind of thing in, in a sense um, with the help of Oprah brought it you know went to the western world so yeah. she has a book the conscious parent and the awakened uh, family and um, really recommends uh, her work she also did uh, co-wrote a book specifically for um, anxiety and supporting anxiety and during the pandemic she was running like daily meditations there's a one of this movement of just getting as many people as possible to move into the space of mindful meditation because of the benefits to mm-hmm. you know to all of us through that so i really i love her work as well um and then there's so many like there's so many different parenting kind of quote unquote experts and and authors and and so i think it's really important to you know to find what works for you um dr Daniel Siegel's work is amazing. Um, but to know that like you're filtering what you read mm-hmm. through then what works for you, what works for your family, because everyone's circumstances are unique and we want to be careful because there is so much information out there and some of it is contradictory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, you know, it can lead to confusion or it can lead to us questioning, you know, ourselves. Uh, so you know, I will suggest resources to clients, but I'll always say, if it resonates for you, yes, you know, sure. this resonated for me, but it might not resonate for you. And that's okay. It's really important to, you know, to sort of find what resonates. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we, we actually talked about this in the last interview as well. I find parenting is kind of a choose your own adventure, right? <laughs> you might go down one path and then you might backtrack yeah. and then go down another path. But that, like, you know what, that's the mess yeah. of part of parenthood is, you know, finding mm-hmm. your way and finding your path and finding what resonates or what works for you or what works for your family and what just kind of, you know, just finding your own way and finding, you know, that, yes. that, that adventure, you know, and, yeah. and your own, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I wanted to swing back and um, touch mm-hmm. on the meditative part of things. Um, mm-hmm. For me, um, and for a lot of my clientele, and I know how good meditation is, and I know how hard it is as a mother <laughs> to be able to even set aside two minutes to myself to yeah. meditate, but I love guided meditation. So mm-hmm. we'll definitely have, to, I'll get you to share some links to, to that um, guided meditation or her meditations or, um, but I think that's so important to have, I find guided meditations for me, just being able to listen to somebody else, Mm -hmm. like, you know, walk me through my own thoughts and just having me walk through like that release, I think is for me is super helpful. And I find a lot of people resonate with that as well too, just having that guided part. Um, but meditation itself is just so important, but a lot of people can't be in their own heads. Mm -hmm. You know, they can't, you know, turn those thoughts off and it's, it's not Mm -hmm. always about turning the thoughts off, but sometimes just redirecting, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, one of the biggest miss I think that people have is that they're doing it wrong if they have thoughts yeah you know so I always say to clients so like think of it as you know you're building a muscle and you know when you're weight training you know you don't build a muscle just holding the weight in your arm right you have to move your arm up and down and so it's sort of the same but it's back and forth this way right so we get distracted and we start thinking evaluating what have you and then we bring it back to present moment awareness whatever that might be right that could be a sound that could be something that we're touching something we're looking at or you know if we're able to it could be our breath right but that's Mm -hmm. sometimes that's too vague for people um and then it's just this back and forth right and sometimes we're going to be wandering for a while you know before we realize and that's okay that doesn't mean that we did it wrong and 
when I was doing some mindful self-compassion training, one of the things that was really helpful was that actually you have this experience at the beginning when you're learning um, what they describe as like backdraft for where in, if anything, you're going to think even more yeah. because our default is to think. And so it's almost like, you know, there's this, this resistance or, you know, sort of like, I don't want to do this. This is wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. And so like all these thoughts start coming up. And so if we, you know, if we can allow that process and, you know, just say like mindfulness is essentially just that present moment awareness. Mm -hmm. So we're not trying to make it any specific way, have a specific outcome, we're just noticing. Yeah. Right. Just just yeah. noticing. And for me, what I have found even more beneficial is to not just have like that time of sitting or however, you know, I'm that dedicated time. But how do I bring mindful awareness into my experiences throughout the day? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's like that's just pausing and lingering for a moment um, to soak up an experience, whether that's beauty in nature, whether that's your children's laughter, whether that's a hug, you know, even something, you know, that is mundane or frustrating as having to do dishes or having to fold laundry, we can turn that into a mindful experience of really connecting with the sensory aspects of it or moving into a place of gratitude for kind of the deeper meaning, right? Like when I'm folding laundry, I'm, I'm, reminded that I have these beautiful people in my life that are healthy and growing and you know these these clothes represent that and you know I'm not I, I don't love doing laundry <laughs> <laughs> and it, certainly there's gotten to be more and more laundry as it's about <laughs> older, but you know just these these little things right and how can we make it a little bit easier in the warmer weather I love taking my laundry outside on my porch and you know I'll fold it on my porch and that just makes it a little bit more so I think if we can be flexible in our mindfulness practice, movement sometimes works much better for people than just sitting. So mm -hmm. whether that's stretching or whether that's a mindful walk, um, that really helps to be able to be more consistent with it and then reap the benefits from it. For sure, yeah, I love that. Was there anything else that you wanted to touch on today or go over or talk about? Um, so can I make a little bit of an invite? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay, so, you know, as I was mentioning, I've been really thinking about the impacts of the pandemic on us, body, mind, and spirit, and, you know, hopefully we're in recovery. <laughs> We're, we're able to say that we're, we can recover now. You know, I thought last September I was, you know, promoting recovery <laughs> from pandemic. I was like, no, we're still in this pandemic. Yeah. Um, but so in honor of maternal mental health, um, I have uh, some, some women that I know that do intuitive dance and uh, art and singing and different movement. Uh, and myself, I'll be sharing a little bit about um, reflective writing and how that can be beneficial. Um, so we have a what's calling a, a virtual retreat. And it's in my Facebook group called More Than Mothers. And that's because, you know, I, I chose that title because I think that, you know, while motherhood is an amazing job in and of itself, mm -hmm. that part of our journey is also to come back to who we are besides being a mother. Um, so that, uh, you know, we're able to feel that we can make that time to mm -hmm. honor those different aspects of who we are and not put so much pressure on our children to, you know, to bring, um, bring that sense of satisfaction or fulfillment or happiness in our life. Um, and so the virtual retreat is just basically uh, starting the first week in May, there's going to be a little activity at lunchtime and it'll be recorded uh, so that if people can't make it live, they can come after. And it's just to help move, move some of this stress and this worry and this pressure out of our body, you know, through the pandemic motherhood, it's been con all consuming, you know, especially mm -hmm. if we've been having to either teach, you know, our children at home, or if we've had nowhere to be able to go to do the activities we would normally do with baby and that. So, you know, a lot of people have said, like, I've kind of forgotten, like, what makes me happy or what I enjoy. So just kind of 
giving people a chance to play and have fun with no pressure to have to create anything specific, but just to get back into sort of some of that, that energy. Um, and yeah, so that's a, a free virtual retreat that um, I can share the link for, for you if you want that starts in May and then I am doing the breaking free from perfectionism program so yes. if that's something that people are resonating with and they want to join I would love to, to have them and we'll have a private Facebook group where the material will be there and I'll be popping on for some different uh, video teachings as well as a number of you know sort of guided exercises reflective questions yeah, amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. So what's the best way to get a hold of you, Nicole? Um, do you prefer email, website, contact, uh, Instagram? What's kind of what's the best way to reach out? Yeah, so I mean, if people want to learn more about me, of course, you can go to my my website. Um, if people uh, reach out to me in a DM through Instagram, then I will just give them my email address to, you know, so that there's that privacy component as opposed to having conversation on social media. I do offer uh, free up to 15 minute phone calls, chats, just to kind of, you know, give people a chance to ask me questions to try to see, are we a fit? Do I, you know, do I feel comfortable with her? Does it sound like she, you know, would be able to, you know, support me, be you know, before you commit to, um, you know, to a full, to a full paid session. Um, so yeah, so email or call or like I say, you know, sometimes people want to do a little bit of research. So you're certainly welcome to, you know, to uh, check out the website. And there's lots of different free gu guides that I have under the free resources section, um, as well as interviews that I've done in that and articles Amazing. that I've written. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's wonderful. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us today and having this nice raw chat about <laughs> everything. <laughs> we yeah. covered a good variety of targets. We'll definitely have to um, have another chat and maybe even a series of uh, conversations maybe on the podcast and chatting it about a few different um, things because you've got that big bubble. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that we can definitely chat more on and have uh, deeper conversations. Everybody today, we're just like, we could talk for hours, it feels like sometimes, right? But yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you for this initiative. It's, uh, it's really wonderful just to give people a space to come to because, you know, we have Google, but Google can be very overwhelming. So yes. <laughs> Google can be like a black hole, right? You know, yes. very, very easily. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. another thing touched on today as well too is the the abyss of google can be very scary so i i that was one of the big things about creating this and and the pandemic kind of inspired it um just to have more of these raw conversations and just you know talking about you know what's out there and who can support you and yeah i love it awesome yeah. thank Great. you so thank much. much rebecca bye everybody Yeah. <laughs>